Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Space Week. We are at Black Rock Castle Observatory. And if this is your first time joining us, be sure to hit that subscribe button and that notification bell. Like the video as well so that you get notified the next time we do a live stream like this. We do them pretty often. So join us anytime. It's a lot of fun. We got a lot of things that are going to be cool planned today for the art side of the house, as well as the space sides. We're blending it together. We are going to be learning to paint nebula and exoplanets. This is a way to kick off Space Week. Today is October 4th, the first day of Space Week. And we are also celebrating 100 hours of astronomy with the International Astronomical Union. So thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget. As you're watching the stream, you can drop your comments and questions into the comment section that's going on there. And we'll be able to answer your questions for you live here during the stream. So we've got our artists for you and I am going to introduce the team as well. Our artists for the day are Donna and Rob. Hi guys, thanks for joining us. Hi Thank Danielle, hi everybody. <laughs> uh, you can hear us all right there? All good. <laughs> so Donna and Rob, uh, they'll be walking us through the steps to create your work of art. And we also have on screen with us today, Quivine. We'll be jumping over to him because he will be giving us a little tour of the night sky as we go along. Hi, Quivine. How's it going? Good, good. Happy Space Week. Happy Space Week. <laughs> um, and I am Danielle, your host. So I'll be asking all the questions here. So real quick, before we get started, we just want to give a shout out to a few of the schools. We have Caroline Educate Together, St. Columbus Girls National School, and Claire Galway National School. Thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, so we are going to start off with Donna and Rob. And can you guys just go through um, the prep for painting? What do we need? How are we going to get this going? How are we going to join you on this artistic journey today? Okay, guys, so we're going to be doing one of two paintings. So you can decide which you want to do. If you want to follow me, I'm going to be painting a nebula. Here's something we painted earlier. This one was painted by Quivine. It's called the Ghostly Veil Nebula. He's going to show you what the real one looks like in just a minute. Here's another example of a nebula that was painted earlier in the week. I've always wanted to do that whole, and here's one we prepared earlier thing. What I'm going to try and paint today is the Crab Nebula, which is this big, beautiful one that you can see here behind you. If you're wondering where a nebula is, don't worry. Queen is going to tell you just a little bit later. Donna, what are you going to be painting? I'm going to be painting an exoplanet. So an exo the cool thing about an exoplanet is that you can make it any color you want. You can make, have, give it any texture you want, um, and it will be your own creative design. Very cool. So before we get started, you need to decide which one you want to do because you need slightly different materials. If you're going to do the exoplanet, you're going to need something round, like a cup, like what Donna has here. Or if you've got a very good palette, you can use maybe a paper plate, and you can use that as like a template for the size of the plant. If you're following along with me, all you really need is one big brush and a sponge. With Donna, you're going to need a brush, but you probably don't need the sponge. You can add one if you want to for a little bit of texture. So the first thing we're going to do is get ready with our palette. Now, you probably saw that I only asked you to get ready with three colors, red, blue, and yellow. Those are called our primary colors. And the reason that I only want you to do those is because you can use them to make any colors. So we're gonna start off by making what we call a color view. So when you prep your palette, you wanna use something like a paper plate because you can make a big mess on that and nobody's gonna get mad at you. Don't use your table. Like I did last night. And my husband wasn't very happy. And then we're going to put them up onto a fresh clean canvas so we can figure out what colors make what. You don't need a ton of paint here either, unless you've got a very, very big canvas. And depending on the type of paint you use, you'll have to adjust ever so slightly. We recommend that you use poster paint or acrylic paints, if you've got watercolors, they're going to behave a little bit differently. So we'll go through that in a little while. Here we're going to start with our color wheel. So I'm going to get a big dot of red. There. Add a yellow. And a dab of blue. Now, what do you think happens if I make the red and the blue? Shout out your teacher. They'll tell you if you're right or wrong. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a very muddy purple. So if you mix red and blue, you get purple. So if you've got a purple planet that you want to paint, all you got to do is mix your red and your blue. If you're cleaning off your brush, 
Just use water with acrylic composter paints and a bit of paper towel and not take off most. So what do you think will happen if I mix the blue and the yellow? Sam, what do you think happens? I think it's going to be green. You sure? <laughs> yeah. You know, it is green. Very muddy green, but green on the left. <laughs> if you want it to be lighter, just add a little bit more yellow. Yeah. And you've also got your white and dark, or black paint, you know, darker as well. Like for more white paint for a lighter color, and more black paint for. Want the final mix then? Red and yellow? I'm not going to kind of expect. Orange. You sure? <laughs> We're going to test you now. <laughs> Fair enough. There you go. So all you need is those three colors, and you can get any colors that you want. So keep mixing those and experiment. You want to see if you can get even more colors. First thing we're going to do to prep for this on both paintings, paint both canvases completely black. So while we do that, we mean that was painting an exoplanet. If you tell us a bit about what an exoplanet actually is, maybe how we find them, that kind of thing. Absolutely. We can take a look at a couple of places in the sky where we can really see exoplanets. So uh, we're going to take a look at the night sky for tonight. Uh, it's not nighttime yet. This is daytime. This is daytime right now. We're just after 12 o'clock. So we are going to move uh, into sunset. We'll leave the sky get a little bit darker. And there are a lot of uh, exoplanets. We've got almost 5,000 planets that we know of that go around a star besides our sun. And that's really what makes a planet an exoplanet. It just goes around a star that isn't our sun. And we are pretty sure that there are some planets out there that aren't going around a star at all. So you can see as the sun is going down tonight, as we come up to eight o'clock, we've got Venus, Saturn and Jupiter. So those are planets going around our sun. Those are in our solar system. But we will turn away from Jupiter and Saturn here in the south. We're going to turn all the way around to the Plough or the Big Dipper. So the Plough, the Big Dipper, it's a very, very famous shape in the sky. These seven stars, they can help you find the North Star. So they're very, very famous. They're part of a very big constellation called Ursa Major or the Bear. So we can see all of these lines joined together. This is one constellation, Ursa Major. And down here, we have this very small constellation, Canis Venatici or Canis Venatici. Here are the pictures. Canis Venatici means the hunting dogs. And you can see it's two little dogs hunting after the bear. And there is the bear. Uh, we'll stick with just using the lines for now. I think they're a little bit easier to measure. So we want to start here at the very top, the very front of the plow. We'll come down through the back of the plow, almost on a diagonal and a little bit out the other side towards this line in the sky. Uh, so we're going in between Canis Venatici and the plough. Over here is where we would find a planet and a star called Hat P36 and Hat P36b. Not very exciting names. And I'll explain where we get those names in just a second. So this is Hat P36, the high altitude telescope's 36th star with a planet. Uh, the planet going around Hat P36 is called Hat P36b. And this gives us room to discover a Hat P36c, Hat P36d, and E and F. Of course, the High Altitude Telescope, this is the 36th star with the planet it discovered. So there is a HAT P35, there's a HAT P37. Uh, there's quite a few of these stars named after the telescope that discovered them. So we here in Ireland have been given an opportunity to rename this particular star. We're not the only country who got this chance. As I said, there are thousands of exoplanets all across the sky, but this one is always visible for us here in Ireland. So the International Astronomical Union, uh, the same group that we're celebrating 100 hours of astronomy with, the IAU, they gave this particular star and planet to Ireland and other stars and planets to other countries around the world. So this star and planet are now called Tyran and Bran. Uh, so you might know about an old Irish story about a woman named Tyran who got turned into a dog by an evil fairy, Octhalv, and when she gave birth, she gave birth to two puppies who went on to be Ku Cullen's hunting dogs, Bran and Skjolan. That constellation is the constellation of the hunting dogs. So that's why Ireland's star and planet with a hunting dog, they're off in that constellation. 
So that is one particular exoplanet that you'll be able to find in the sky tonight. But as I said, there are thousands of them out there. And hopefully we'll get a chance to rename a few more in the future. So I always wanted to name a planet uh, Nuada Argetlam after another one of the old Irish mythological stories. And hopefully we'll get a chance when more planets get discovered in the future. So uh, from here, I don't want to get into too much of the astronomy before we're ready. So I think we might be ready to jump back to uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel and Rob and Donna to do a little bit more of the painting. And very soon I'll be back to talk to you about some nebulae. Thanks for that, Queen. That was really, really fun. I always love looking at the night sky and Stellarium is such a good tool because you're able to use it on a laptop or even if you have a phone or a tablet, there's an app for it as well. And it's free, it's open source. So it's a really good tool for being able to, being able to see what's in the night sky at the time. Especially right now, we have so many cool planets and stuff in the sky. What's, uh, you mentioned your favorite, what your favorite, um, not favorite, but what your choice of name would be for a planet. So, I never really thought about, well, actually, I know exactly what I did. When we were doing the the, um, the exoplanet competition, I said, yeah, of course, like we name it Danielle. That's the most obvious choice. But <laughs> Rob and Donna, do you have, um, what would you do? What would you name your, your planet if you had a choice? I am a huge Star Trek nerd. Um, so my favorite character is Mr. Spock. You guys are probably too young to remember Star Trek, but Mr. Spock used to do this and he had big pointy ears. He was from a planet called Vulcan. So I think I'd like to call a planet Spock. I think I call him after one of my children. Oh. After two then though. <laughs> There's plenty to go around. We can name two. What are your kids' names? Sarah and Donnie. Hi Sarah and Donnie, if you're watching at home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so guys. You can probably see, uh, in terms of next steps, that I painted mine completely black. Uh, if you haven't got to that stage yet, don't panic, but okay to let it dry now a little bit. Donna's left a little bit of white in the middle, so if you want to, you can leave a little bit of white. If you painted it all black, that's fine too, because the kind of paints that we use aren't uh, see-through. So you can layer the black on top, or the, the other colors on top of the black. Afterwards. So it's just a little bit helpful to leave a little bit of white. So the reason I took white is so we can blend from the dark black into the blue and then light blue and white. So if you have painted the black, then you can just start with a white streak in the middle and blend your colors darker out into the black. I'm just going to pull that up closer to the camera so you can get a really nice view of it. It's really pretty. I really like that one. So the next step that I'm going to be taking is waiting for my canvas to dry just a little bit more. And I'm going to try to paint the crab nebula behind here. So what I've got to do is pick three colors that I want to go from. So you can probably tell that there's a lot of blue here in the middle. Moving out to kind of a yellowy orange, and then at the very outside, there's green. So those are the colors that I'm going to use. There's a lot of red just below the table here as well, so I might add a little bit of red too. So what I'm going to do is just line up my palette with those three colored paints, and we're going to sponge to it in just a little while. So, uh, what's up? Where are you, Donna? Need to draw the shape of the planet or anything, or um, you can draw different. on the shape of the planet first before you start doing your before you start doing your blue color, just so you have a guide. So I'm gonna just use this cup and draw with a pencil just the rough shape of it. So this is my planet here. So what I'm gonna do is when I I'm, I'm gonna use a sponge to dab on the blue color. I'm gonna start with the darkest blue, maybe mix in a tiny bit of black. As you see, some of the I have the black fading out here. So if I dab a little bit of blue over it, and then try and keep the center part clear. If you want to do a light color, and if you want your planet to be a lighter color, because it'll be harder to paint over the darker color. So it doesn't matter if you get it in a little bit, but just especially over here because we're going to shadow. So we're going to have the shadow from the bottom. So if you if you get a little bit of black or a little bit of blue here, it doesn't matter. And um, so I'm going to my blue maybe mix in a tiny bit of black. I'm just going to start sponging it on here. You don't have to put a little, an awful lot of paint on, just Yeah. I was panicking because I'm not an artist. Donna is an artist, but I. <laughs> so, have you got a favorite planet that you use? To, like, cause obviously, exoplanets, we don't know what they look like. So, it helps to like use a planet that we already know what it looks like as our inspiration and maybe change the color or the shape a little bit. 
Have you got a favorite planet? Donna? I do. If you can see here, I have used Jupiter. Well, it looks like Mars from here, but I have little white uh, flecks going through it. So Jupiter is kind of an orangey brown color with white streaks going all the way through. And it, this was what I was going to do, but then I kind of liked the way that the shadows are falling on this, so I just left a little bit of white going through. But you can do any type you want. If you want to sponge it, you can use a sponge to give it texture, or you can use a little paintbrush just to flick a bit of white or a bit of pink or any color you want through it. Maybe you could show the people at home what Jupiter actually looks like, so they have an idea of how to like tweak it. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about Jupiter and why it's so cool. Absolutely. So we can take a look at Jupiter here and. We can take a look at Jupiter tonight. Uh, that is, I think that's one of the things that makes uh, some of the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and Venus, they're especially cool because you can really see them in the sky. Uh, so here we go, just after eight o'clock, it's about half eight, and up in the southeast, there is Jupiter and Saturn. Now, in the real sky, they won't have names on them, but they will still look like this. Jupiter is going to be the brightest thing in the sky. It's brighter than any of the stars. Only Venus, the sun, and the moon are brighter than Jupiter. And at half eight tonight, none of those other things will be in the sky. So Jupiter is the brightest thing. It also doesn't twinkle. Only stars go twinkle, twinkle, not planets. So looking at Jupiter tonight, it's going to look fantastic. So even if you look at Jupiter with a pretty small telescope, you should see four of Jupiter's moons around the planet. And by going through different nights, those moons will change position. So you get to see them orbiting around Jupiter just by going out a few different nights in a row. Tonight, we get to see the shadows from some of Jupiter's moons. So here is a real close-up with a much bigger telescope. And we can see those stripes that Donna was talking about. So we can see these paler colors, these kind of white and beige bits, and these darker kind of browny orange bits. So just like the Earth, Jupiter is warmer at the equator and cooler at the poles. So you have these different temperature or climate zones and different climate zones on Jupiter have different colors. So it's a lovely stripy planet, almost like an Easter egg. It has these dark spots tonight, which are shadows from its moons. These paler spots are storms and they're almost always visible. Tomorrow night, we get to see the great red spot, a huge storm that could swallow the whole planet Earth. It's also about 400 years old, so very big and very, very old, but you will have to wait until tomorrow. Tonight, it's on the wrong side of the planet. Just like us, Jupiter is always turning around, but here on Earth, it takes 24 hours. On Jupiter, it only takes 10 to turn the whole way around. Uh, so with a slightly smaller telescope, there is the great red spot. So it's a little trickier to see if your telescope is smaller, but it's definitely still possible. We can see it's back there a few more nights into the future as well. So Jupiter is going to be a fantastic planet to take a look at all through space week, all the way through to the 10th, and even a little bit after that on our way to Halloween. So that's Jupiter, but as you might be able to tell, there are some more planets in the sky. So uh, maybe we can get somebody else's favorite planet, maybe Rob or Danielle, and we'll see if they're visible in the sky as well. Thank you for that, Corina. It's fantastic. Jupiter is definitely one of my favorites. It is one of the easiest to spot in the night sky. And um, it's visible now, which is great, because then you can have, uh, not you don't even have to have a telescope or any sort of expensive equipment to go out and be able to see it in the night sky. So um, if anybody's able to go out and it's clear enough, then you can actually go out with your own eye. You don't have to even have a pair of binoculars or anything. And you see a bright, a very bright uh, spot in the sky towards the south. And like Quivine was saying, if it's not twinkling, if it's a constant light, then you're probably looking at Jupiter. Right now, it's pretty much the brightest thing in the sky in the early evening at night. So Jupiter is a fun one. Not my favorite, though. My favorite is actually Neptune. For many reasons, my favorite color is blue, and Neptune is a beautiful blue color. Um, but also because it's thought that it rains diamonds on Neptune. There's also not a lot known about Neptune because we've only really been out there a few times and it's very far away from us. So there's a lot to explore, which I love that idea as well. Uh, so yeah, Neptune is my favorite. What about you guys, Rob and Donna, do you have favorite planets? I like Saturn because I like the rings of Saturn, I think. And it looks different than all the other planets because it has nice big rings, right? 
<laughs> pretty. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's a really good idea, guys. So Saturn is another type of planet. Some planets do have disks around them, like even um, I think Mars has a very, very faint disk or will have a very faint disk when it destroys its moons. So Bibi will be able to tell you a little bit better about that. But we do see a lot of uh, custom art that shows a planet with a ring around it. So Quibi, maybe if you show what Saturn looks like, uh, people who follow along at home might have an idea of how to draw a ring around their planet. In fact, I think you have a Saturn behind you right there, don't you? Cool. Let's have a little bit closer look at Saturn and what, what colors it looks like. So absolutely, uh, we can take a look at Saturn and we can definitely take a look at Saturn tonight because it's right there. So a moment ago, we looked at Jupiter. Now we're looking at Saturn. The Saturn isn't as bright as Jupiter. So watching out to see if it's nice and still, nice and steady, not twinkling like a star, that will really, really help. So here it is. Uh, we'll take a nice close look at Saturn so that we can see those rings really, really clearly. And it is, we talk about Saturn's ring, but really it is rings. You can see it's broken up with these gaps and we usually give them letters. So there's an A ring, a B ring, a C ring, all the way down to G. Saturn has quite a few rings around it, uh, but some of them are quite faint, especially these inner ones here on the inner edge. You can see the shadow that Saturn is casting on its ring. And if you look real closely, you can even see a shadow on the planet from the ring blocking out some of the light. Uh, so this ring isn't solid. It's more like a cloud of dust and rock and ice. And we think it came from a moon or a comet that broke up around Saturn uh, probably quite far in the past. It could be millions of years ago that this ring first formed. It won't last forever. This ring is really big and really bright and really, really obvious. But over time, some of this dust and rock is going to fall down into Saturn and it will burn up the same way that shooting stars uh, burn up in our atmosphere, the way meteors burn up in our sky. This is what you can see with quite a small telescope, something like four or five inches aperture. We're just about seeing Saturn's rings here, but they are visible even with telescopes this small. And we can see this lovely orange moon, which is Titan, Saturn's largest moon, and the only one with a thick and permanent atmosphere. Now, Saturn has a very big, very thick, very bright and obvious ring. Jupiter's ring is incredibly, incredibly thin, and we believe that that is where Saturn's ring is headed, that over time, its ring will fade away. Uh, this line here is where we see all of the planets, even planets like Uranus and Neptune that aren't visible to the naked eye. They're always somewhere along this line. So let's take a look. Whoa. That is definitely not Neptune. That is a very different object. Uh, we'll take a look for Neptune. We'll take a look for Danielle's favorite planet because it is a lovely blue color. And there it is on the ecliptic. It's right in line with these two gas giants. Neptune is an ice giant, which I think sounds even more impressive than a gas giant. A gas giant doesn't sound too scary, but an ice giant, that, that sounds a lot more spooky to me. We can see Neptune's incredibly thin ring here. So Neptune, Uranus, they have very thin rings. There's even some comets and some meteors and asteroids that have rings around them. And as Rob mentioned, planets that don't have rings today could get them in the future. Uh, so Mars's moons, one of them is falling down towards the planet and it will eventually crash into Mars. The dust and rock that that throws up could form a thin ring, something like this thin ring that we're seeing here around Neptune. Now, Neptune's a beautiful planet, but here it's looking a little plain. There we go. If we give Neptune a bit of time to turn around, it's got its own dark blue sun, very similar to the great red spot on Jupiter with very, very powerful wings. So Neptune has that lovely blue color. Saturn is that lovely beige with those beautiful rings. Jupiter's stripy, Mars is red. Even with the planets in our solar system, we've got a lot of options when it comes to color. And with exoplanets, we've got even more. They can be almost any color that you can imagine, or at least we think so. We haven't really checked yet. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Thanks so much for that, Queen. And thank you for showing my favorite planet. It's always nice to see it. Everyone always talks about Saturn like Donna. Of course, that's the favorite of the solar system. It's beautiful rings. And okay, yes, Neptune's my favorite, but Saturn is a beautiful planet. And if you ever get a chance to look at it through a telescope, it's incredible. I'll never forget my first time looking at Saturn and seeing the rings of Saturn through a telescope. You don't even need to have a telescope that's very, very large to be able to see the rings. 
if you even have a small one, four inch, three and a half inch, four inch telescope, you'll be able to see the rings of Saturn. Or if you have a very steady hand, I have seen Saturn through binoculars, but you have to be very, very steady to be able to see it. And you can't really see uh, the rings very distinctly, but you can tell that the, sh the planet's kind of um, shaped like a bean. So you can tell that the, the rings are there. You can see it, but um, it's absolutely amazing if you ever get the chance to see Saturn through a telescope. So Rob and Donna, how are we doing over with our, uh, our art projects here? How are we coming along? So I have started using a brush on top of the sponging. When I sponge it in my colors, really the darker blue, and then I mixed a little bit of white in, made it a little bit lighter and then put a white streak in the center so that it looks like the light is coming through here and it's getting darker as it goes out. And um, so I, now I'm using a paintbrush just to kind of blend it. You don't have to have much paint on it, very tiny bit, and let it kind of blend itself. So see the way the blues are blending into the black and then if you blend in this way, then it's white. So we just want to make it blend as much as we can. So even if your paintbrush is a bit, if, if it's a bit wet, you can just get a bit of, a bit of um, tissue, wipe it off a bit so that it's nearly dry, and then just blend in. Cool. It's just a simple back and forth. Yeah, just back and forth like this. I think it looks a little bit like a Milky Way galaxy. I mean, you know, she loves to just in a little bit. So for the uh, nebula we're about to get to now, my pants is finally dry. We're going to start, if you're following along with my one, we're going to start with the blue color in the middle. But you do not have to use this color if you don't want to. There's lots of different types of nebulas out there that are a lot of different types of colors. But what you want to do, I, I would recommend you start with your lightest color right in the middle and just go real heavy and put that in. Worry about the other colors later. So I've mixed a nice light blue like we see here. I'm going to pick it up on the sponge and just dab it in there really loose like that. Probably see that it's starting to look a little bit misty and pretty. Very, very simple. So just keep that up. And when you come back to me later, we'll move on to the next color. So quickly, by the way, what is a nebula? I've heard nebulas being called a lot of different things. Is, is it one th single thing or is there lots of different types of things? What makes a nebula a nebula? So uh, what really makes a nebula a nebula is that it is some sort of cloud. Now here on Earth, we mainly get one type of cloud. We usually just get rain clouds. But if you think about it, there are a few other clouds that we get here on Earth as well. You can get clouds of dust, clouds of sand, clouds of smoke. Out in space, you have a lot more variety. Uh, almost anything can form a cloud in space. We have clouds of hydrogen, clouds that were created by the explosion of a supernova at the end of a star's life. We have all sorts of clouds. So we can start actually by taking a look at uh, the nebula I painted and the nebula that Rob is painting because they're two of the prettiest types for a very particular reason. So the Crab Nebula and the Ghostly Veil Nebula, oh, thank you very much, Rob, uh, those are supernova remnants. They're the remains of a massive star, much bigger than our sun, that's collapsed at the end of its life. So looking up at my screen here, we're back to just about half eight. We've got this nice triangle in the sky, and this is called the Summer Triangle. Along one side of the triangle, so there's a very bright star, Vega, and then the other two, Deneb and Altair, we're looking at the Deneb and Altair side, a little bit closer to Deneb, just up here. This is where we find the ghostly veil. Now we'll start by taking a look at it in the city. Here it is. So it definitely looks very ghostly and faint, almost like a veil. If I take away some of the light pollution, all of the extra light that we have here in the city, then you get to see the colors just a little bit better. Uh, one of the reasons I like this nebula is because this bit over on the west, this kind of pointy blue bit, is called the Witch's Broom Nebula. I think that's very appropriate now that we're coming up to Halloween. This is what's left behind when a massive star reaches the end of its life and goes supernova, blasting all of the elements it's created out into space around it. Different elements light up different colors, and over the course of the star's life, they can make a bunch of different elements, oxygen and carbon, nitrogen and iron and nickel. With all of these different elements lighting up different colors, you get this beautiful rainbow effect in the sky. And from the city, with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, it really can look like this. It is visible, uh, just a little bit faint. So that's the Ghostly Veil Nebula. It's a beautiful example of uh, the end of a star's life. If we come forward, I believe, in morning time, I'm pretty sure we have to be pretty close to morning for the Crab Nebula. And there we go, there's the Crab Nebula. 
and there it is uh, very much in Taurus. So we're looking early in the morning here. We're here at half four in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, sign us up. And we're looking just above Orion in the constellation of Taurus. Here we go, here is the Crab Nebula. And you might be able to tell, this looks very different from the Crab Nebula that Bob is painting. And this is just because they were taken by different telescopes using different filters, so we get different colors. So that means if you want to paint the Crab Nebula but you don't like blue, you could make that blue center a different color. There is a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to these colors. And they will look a certain way if you were seeing them with your actual eyes. But when we take these images with telescopes, we often have to add in color. So that means you can make them lots of different colors if you'd like to. Those supernova remnants come from the end of a star's life. But down here in the constellation of Orion, we have another kind of nebula where we see the beginning of a star's life. So this is the constellation of Orion with the shoulders and the feet and the belt. Orion's belt is very, very famous, but for tonight, we're going to look at Orion's sword. And just in case you don't believe me, here's the picture of Orion, and there is his sword hanging from his belt. So it is his sword that's hanging down between his legs, and this is Orion's nebula. So you can see it's really, really dark and smoky. And this is because this is almost entirely hydrogen. And in this hydrogen cloud, little bits of hydrogen stick together, the same way droplets of water in our rain clouds stick together. When we have enough droplets of water, it forms a raindrop and it falls out of the cloud. When enough hydrogen is packed together, the star starts to produce light and heat. This is also called a stellar nursery, and it's where stars come from. Now we're seeing this again through the light pollution of the city. If we get rid of that, you can see those blues and oranges far, far clearer. And this is another beautiful, smoky, fuzzy nebula that you can make. So whether it's the beginning of a star's life, like uh, Orion's nebula, or the end of the star's life, like the Ghostly Veil Nebula and the Crab Nebula, there are a lot of different shapes we can pull off. One last one is a planetary nebula. So uh, a supernova remnant is what gets left behind when a massive star reaches the end of its life. When a star more like our sun reaches the end of its life, it falls apart a little bit more gently. It's not so much an explosion, but we can see this lovely circular shape of the ring nebula from the outer layers of the star falling apart. And we call these planetary nebula because it does kind of look like a planet. If you, you know, if you close one eye and squint a little bit, it might kind of look like a planet because it's round. And this is how a lot of these things get named. Uh, you might notice the Crab Nebula doesn't look that much like a crab. It did in very early telescopes. You know, it looked a bit like a crab. Again, if you squint a little bit and close one eye. Uh, same with this one. This is another planetary nebula. It's another circular shape. And again, it might look like an Eskimo or clown if you're not really looking properly. And with early telescopes, we don't only get a faint and fuzzy view, which gives us plenty of artistic license when it comes up with uh, interpreting what we'd like our image to be. So there are loads of nebulae out there, loads of different types of almost every different color and with lots of different functions. These nebula, whether they're creating stars or seeding the galaxy with new elements, they do serve a function in the history of our galaxy. And speaking of, if we tilt back just a little here in a nice dark location, this glow stretching across the sky is our galaxy. Our galaxy looks pretty good early in the evening. Uh, if you are out in the countryside, the center of our galaxy has this nice orangey, reddish, kind of browny, smoky color, whereas the outer edge of the galaxy is more of this bluish. And the Summer Triangle, which we mentioned uh, just a little bit earlier, the Milky Way goes right through it. So even if you are in the city and you don't see the Milky Way with your eyes, it's right in there. You just need a telescope to take a closer look. And then you get to see these smoky, fuzzy shapes from our galaxy. So hopefully that will give you some inspiration to pick your own nebulae to paint. I think Rob is after making a bit more progress with his nebula. So we'll uh, check back in with uh, Donna and Rob. Thanks, Kumi. Yep, I'm after laying down all the blue in the middle. So for me, the next step is to take a yellowy, orangey color and we're right around the edge of the blue. But you may have a completely different color yourselves, but all you want to do is just pick up the paint nice and loose and just dab it around the edges like that. You want, you can pull your paintbrush through or you can just use a bit of a sponge. But you can see that the orange doesn't stay perfectly on the edge, so it kind of pulls in towards the middle. You can just drag it in a little bit and it gives that impression. Yeah, that's starting to look a little bit like it. It's going to take a little bit of work, but we've got time, so keep tipping away at yours. Uh, what's the next step for you? Okay, so I'm going to take my cup again. I know we drew a bite earlier, but now we're going to just 
take it back on just so we can start painting the exoplanet. So we'll draw another pencil line around our cloud. And because acrylics are really easy to draw on top of, then it should be really, you should be able to see it. Um, and this is the lighter part also. So now we're going to um, start painting. We can come back and fill in some edges and stuff here and lighten this part and stuff after you've finished your exoplanet. So pick your color, whatever color you want to paint it, and start with the darker, or the lighter, sorry. Start with the lighter color. So I'm going to choose a red. So the lightest that you want is going to be up here. And then we're going to have slightly darker down here so it looks like a bit of a shadow. So I'm going to... That one made it look 3D when you did it the first time. Yes. So the... Do we have a bit of a zoom in? It's like that. So we're going, to be, we're going to be a little bit lighter here. So add bits of white to make it a little bit lighter. And then as it goes down, it'll be vibrant red in the middle if you're using or whatever color you're using. And then at the bottom, we're going to have um, slightly darker. So it looks like there's a shadow coming in. You can make it darker by adding a tiny bit of blue or a tiny bit of black or and a tiny bit of white then to make it look lighter. So Daniel, uh, we're running a space image uh, program so that people want to see some really cool pictures of the moon. Can you tell people a little bit more about that? Yeah, so we are going to be giving out images, individual unique images of the moon from taken here at the observatory. And we have, um, there are a few craters on the moon that have Irish connections. So we are highlighting that in our space image program. So if you're interested in getting your own unique image, then you can register on the Space Week website, spaceweek.ie, and we'll be sending them out to you. And the moon's one of my favorite. I, I think people, um, people always ask me, what's your favorite object to image in the night sky or to look at through a telescope? And the Ring Nebula that Quibine showed, had showed us earlier, he um, was showed us with the beautiful colors around it. It almost looks like a rainbow in a circle. That's one of the first deep sky objects I ever imaged. So I love it. Um, and galaxies and uh, exoplanets are amazing and, and uh, black holes are fun, but I always come back to the moon. The moon is just my favorite thing. I think part of the reason is because it's different. Every time you look at it, it's in a different phase in a different part of the sky, different craters are visible. And so we are focusing on specific craters. One in particular is Agnes Mary Clerk, who has a quark connection and she has her very own crater visible on the moon. It's in a really good spot too, because if you're familiar with the moon itself, the face of the moon, you see the man on the moon, and um, her, her crater is very, very close to the edge of the man of the moon. So you can actually see it on um, the visible side of the moon. It's not the far side or something like that. You can see it. Um, well, you can't see it with the naked eye. It's a small crater, but if you have a telescope, you can. So the images that we've taken from the observatory through the telescope, we, you can actually see her crater. So if you're interested, check out the uh, space image um, program we have running for Space Week. You can still register for that now. So, uh, Donna's still working on our planet. It's looking really cool. This works best if you let each color mostly dry before you step to the next step. So while we're waiting for this little bit of orange around the blue to dry, could you maybe you could show us what the Agnes Clark crater looks like? On Absolutely. So as, uh, as we mentioned, if you're familiar with the moon, it is a nice, easy crater to find. Uh, but we are going to have to move a little bit into the future to find it. So the moon, uh, at the end of Space Week on the 10th, the moon will be setting very near to sunset. So we actually need to move a little bit past Space Week uh, to come up to a lovely full moon like this one. So taking a nice close look here, a lot of people, when they look at the moon, uh, they imagine different things. People imagine a face on the moon or a person on the moon. When I look at the moon, I imagine a football player or a soccer player. And this definitely takes a little bit of imagination. But this dark area here, one of these seas on the moon, one of these smooth, flat areas that are nice and dark, this is the head of the football player. This dark area is the body of the football player. We have a leg here, a leg there, and a football or a soccer ball. So that's the football player on the moon. The body of the football player on the moon is the sea of tranquility. 
just above that in the next sea, we have these two very small pale craters. So I will add pause time so that the moon doesn't go sliding away. And we'll start to take a closer look here at this sea. So this dark area here is a sea. Medium ones are called seas. Smaller dark areas, like this dark area down here, they're called bays. And if we start zooming in, you'll see that there are two pale craters down in this dark area. It's the smaller one. So zooming in really, really, really close here, we've got two pale craters. The smaller one is Clark Crater, named after Mary Agnes Clark. So that is just one of four craters on the moon uh, that are named after an Irish person. So as well as Clark Crater, right up there uh, next to the Sea of Tranquility, down at the bottom, down at the south pole of the moon, we have Shackleton Crater, named after Ernest Shackleton, uh, who visited the south pole of the Earth. So we do have a couple of craters on the moon named after Irish people, but there are only about 9,000 named craters on the moon out of almost 100,000 craters total. So a lot of the bigger craters, like uh, Copernicus over there, have names, but the moon is covered in these craters. We don't always notice it. Uh, very often when we look at the moon, you know, it seems nice and smooth and flat. But here, during a half moon, which is really one of the best times to look at the moon or take photos of the moon, now you can see all of those cracks and craters on the white areas. So the white areas of the moon are where it's really rough and cracked and cratered. The dark areas are nice and smooth. So we can break them up into oceans, bays, and seas, but often these dark areas are just called the lowlands, while these white areas are the highlands. And as you can see, they are covered in cracks and craters. Uh, we just don't always notice them as much when the moon is full. It's not quite as obvious and not as easy to see. Look, look way smoother now. So the moon is a great one to take a look at, even just on the 10th, even just at the very end of space week, we'll already be able to see a reasonable bit of the moon. You might even catch a Clark crater on the 10th. It might just be visible uh, if you're out late enough. And just to give you an idea, uh, as Danielle mentioned, when it comes to binoculars, uh, you do often need a very steady hand, especially with big binoculars. This is what the moon, a full moon, would look like through particularly large binoculars. So you can see that Clark Crater is pretty much out of view for us. But if we were to use a small to medium telescope, and this is a ETX 80, quite a small telescope, there are those two white dots, and you can see Clark Crater there as the smaller one. So barely visible. You need to know what you're looking for. But if you do know what you're looking for, it is up there, even with quite small telescopes. And of course, you don't even have to worry about looking at the moon with a telescope uh, if you take part in our uh, moon image campaign. If you get an image of the moon from Black Rock Castle, then you'll already have Clark Crater in that picture. You won't even have to worry about taking a look with a telescope or a binoculars. So that's the moon. And as I said, it is going to get into its best if we get closer to full after the end of space week but on the very last day of space week we will start to see it as the sun goes down Brilliant. Thanks, so guys uh i've started putting in my green remember i mentioned that there was green up here at the top and just below the table is a bit of red uh so it is starting to dry so i'm just going to get in there as quick as i can i do find that it's really helpful when you have a lot of paint on your sponge to go in closer to the center and then as the paint starts to dry start putting it around the outside so that way it creates that slightly faded look that makes it look like a cloud i noticed when donna was painting here that it's really looking very circular almost 3d so donna is there something special you're doing when you're painting to make it do that so like i said i started with some white up here to make it slightly lighter and then put a bit of black down here if you want to go between the black and the white just use a bit of tissue to take the excess paint off um, and have tiny, do tiny little strokes of white and then just blend it in. Your paintbrush needs to be quite dry when you're blending it so that you're not dragging any huge amounts of color over it. So I'm just blending the white parts in and I'm doing it in a curve like this because a planet is round. So you want to get that kind of curve by just tiny little curve like this going over this way and drag over your light color over to your dark. And then you can do the same with your dark, just drag it over to your light. That'll give you the effect of shadow down here, light up here, and the curve of the planet. Really cool. It's almost like you're painting a football. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I'm just going to bring that up a little closer so that people can see those curved strokes, hopefully. I'm not sure if you can properly see that, but I think you get the idea. What I did notice when you put the white on is that it looked a little bit like the polar caps on Mars. Vivian, have you shown us what Mars looks like yet? Yeah, let's, let's throw up Mars for a second while we're waiting for the next batch of drawing, and uh, I'd love to see what that looks like. 
Now, there is a reason that we haven't taken a look at Mars yet. I will show Mars. We love Mars. Mars is a fantastic planet. But it's not going to be very easy to see at this time of the year. And we can absolutely take a look at why. So let's come back to daytime. Here we are, middle of the day. We're going to get rid of the lovely blue sky. So the air around us, the oxygen and nitrogen that make up our atmosphere, that's what's getting lit up blue here. That's what gives us our blue sky. It's the light of the sun lighting up that air. If we get rid of the atmosphere, then you get to see the stars, the planets, and everything else during the day. And well, that's a very red dot, and it is Mars, the red planet. So you can see here, it's really, really, really close to the sun. Over the next couple of months, they'll move apart. Mars will continue orbiting around the sun. So we're going to see Mars in the morning as we come to the end of the year and into next year. But we can tease a little bit here with Solarium and take a look anyway. Uh, so I mentioned that Mars has moons, plural. It's got two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Uh, so there they are. And one of them is going to crash into Mars. Our moon is moving away from us. But Mars's moons, at least one of them, is getting closer to the planet. And speaking of getting closer, here's a nice close view of Mars. And we can see that ice cap up at the top. So what we're seeing here, this frozen slab, this is mostly dry ice. It's mostly frozen carbon dioxide. Uh, there'd be a little bit of frozen water, but a lot of what we see frozen on Mars is dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide, which freezes at about minus 76 degrees Celsius. So Mars can get pretty chilly, especially at the North and South Pole. Uh, just like the Earth, Mars has a pit. So as we go through seasons looking at Mars, it will change which pole is pointed at the Earth. The same way we have our summer in the North while it's winter in the South, a similar thing happens with Mars. Now, we're after moving very far into the future, we're through to January now, but we can see here, taking a look at Mars, Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano on Mars, as well as the Mariner Valley, which is the largest valley in the solar system. So Olympus Mons is an old extinct volcano. It's the big circle over here. These smaller circles are also extinct volcanoes. It's known as the Tharsis region of Mars. It would have been very volcanic a few million years ago, but it's calmed down a lot since then. Uh, the Mariner Valley, we believe it formed very similar to the Grand Canyon, thanks to large amounts of water spilling across the surface of Mars. And it must be pretty large amounts of water to make a canyon like that. Of course, Mars is really, really dry today. We believe that these darker areas uh, may have been more like continents, more like solid land in the past, where these paler areas may very well have been underwater. So Mars could have had quite a lot of water early in its history. But for the moment, all that's really left is frozen at the North and at the South Pole. We're not really going to see the South Pole until Mars' seasons change, and that does take a little bit longer. Mars is a lot further from the sun than we are, so the seasons on Mars last almost twice as long because its year lasts almost twice as long. So that's where Mars is at the moment, right next to the sun. But we'll see that over the next couple of days, Mars moves over to the other side of the sun. And within a couple of months, we will see Mars as the sun is rising in the morning. So uh, here we are, you know, we're very close to a pretty auspicious date. I might as well bring us forward to the 25th of December, which is at least a nice memorable date. And here we are nice and early in the morning on the 25th of December there is Mars. And I do mean nice and early in the morning. This is half seven. So you really do have to get up early to spot Mars. Once we get into December, unfortunately, for the next couple of weeks, we're not going to be able to see Mars. It's just too close to the sun. It's pretty much on the opposite side of the sun for the next couple of days. But it will come back. We do have to look forward to it. And that's another nice thing about the planets. They might disappear behind the sun for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, but they follow a nice regular cycle and that will bring them back into view. So Mars, yeah, it does have those ice caps at the top and at the bottom. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to see it in just another couple of months. Oh, thanks so much for that, Queen. Yeah, Mars is definitely a very cool planet to look at in the night sky. And it's always fun to point out the planet. It's like Neptune's my favorite, but you can't see it with the naked eye. And it's very, very far away. But the visible planets to see without a telescope, you have Venus, you have Earth, obviously, we're here. Mercury is a tricky one, uh, but you can see it at Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So those are the ones that you want to look at when they are visible in the sky. Take advantage of those clear nights and get out there. So how are things looking over there in art world? So I think I have most of the shadows in and the curve of the planet. So I'm going to start putting flex, little white flex, kind of like Jupiter again. 
Um, so I'm gonna, I've got a smaller brush and I'm just gonna start just putting in my own little flecks and then you can blend them in any way you want. So if you want, you can do circles, you can do craters, you can do anything you want because this is an exoplanet and it can look any way that you want it to look. So I'm gonna work away and do some different, I might add in maybe a little bit of purple, maybe a little streak of darker red and just get it to look three-dimensional. And again, when you do the streaks, if you are doing streaks, make sure you stick to the curve. So you make sure that your strokes are going from top around the same shape as the orb. All right, I'm gonna give you guys a close up of the nebula. It looks very messy right now, but trust me, the next steps are gonna make it look a lot more like what we see on the board. So we're just gonna to have to let it dry. But what you've probably noticed is that you've got three main colors, one starting in the center here, which for me was blue, moving out to the yellow and a little bit of green and then out to the red. So when it's gotten to this stage, it's really nice when it starts to dry, to take a little bit of all the colors. So take a little bit of the blue and start dabbing it into the yellow just a little bit so it helps show that they're blending and do the same with the red downwards so that it creates that much more gaseous effect and you can kind of see that it does look from a distance very much like that it's the finishing touches that are going to make it look much more like that in just a minute but daniel what do we have come up for space that people should be excited about Sorry, I'm laughing a little bit at when Quivine kept mentioning in his star show. And he's like, if you kind of just squint one eye and look at it, it kind of looks like a crab nebula. <laughs> and Rob was like, if you look from far away, my painting sort of looks like what's behind. <laughs> Squinting um, makes everything better. Say it again. Squinting makes everything look prettier. So my girlfriend told me. <laughs> uh, well, we have loads going on for Space Week. So um, if you haven't already, go on over to spaceweek.ie and check out all the events that we have running there. Um, we have another live stream coming up later in the week on Thursday. And if you have not, um, if you want, if you can't find something that you want that's already out there, you can create your own event and you can register that event as well. So you can go on to the Space Week website and start your own space event post it out there and then we'll promote it out for you. And um, there are loads of things happening all over the country. So this is a really big year for Space Week because we are focusing on women in space. And that's part of the reason why we are focusing on um, the Agnes Clerk Crater because uh, she was a female astronomer. So that's why she, and she has her name um, immortalized on the moon forever. How cool is that? Uh, so yeah, get involved, get over to Space Week and check out some of the stuff we have going on there. Um, Rob, I'm taking a look. I can see your your painting. It actually is, it is coming along quite well there. Yeah, I've cheated a little bit, guys, and jumped ahead. If you have time, you should totally do what I'm about to do. You know, look at this. You can't really see it because it's so far away for you. But the really bright stars that you can see in the nebula, part of the reason they look so bright is that they got a blue fuzzy edge to them. So in a minute, I'm just going to start slapping as much white as I can on for the stars. If you want to make one or two of them pop, take a little bit of blue and put it in tiny little dabs all around your painting. And when it dries, if you put a little white dot in the center of that, it's going to make it look, the contrast will make it look much, much brighter. So if you've gotten to the stage where you're happy with your gas cloud, just start tapping little bits of blue into it and get ready to put a star or two on it at the end. By the way, Donnie, you remember your, uh, your hoodie. Where'd you get that? This is an ESA hoodie, so it's the International Space Station hoodie um, from the ESA shop. Um, I, we have them in the shop here. Um, as far as I know, Danielle, we have a cool ESA hoodie up for grabs for anybody that enters into a Space Week event. Yeah, so if you go onto the site and you register your own event, then you are automatically entered into winning an ESA space pack, which includes a, an ESA hoodie, which... I pretty much own everything that's out there in terms of NASA ESA gear. So you'll be walking around looking like me, which isn't too shabby. Oh yeah. <laughs> Don't know why Donna's laughing so hard at that. <laughs> Donna, your planet's looking great though. Thank you. What are you gonna name it? So, oh God, oh. You only have one planet. So which of your children will you name? <laughs> How about? I call it Sarah Dahi. So <laughs> <still> <laughs> Why did Sarah go first? I, because she was the first one. 
<laughs> well, unless it's a rogue planet, it's probably going around a star. So you could always call the star Sarah and the planet Dahi. Uh, there might be issues with that, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it something else completely. <laughs> Look, we've been, uh, during the week here at Black Rock Festival Authority, you're going to be doing your regular planetarium shows, but one of the things you're going to be doing uh, is a Irish language one. You're going to tell people a little bit about the objects in the night sky and what they're called, as well. Uh, maybe while we're waiting for this to dry here, you could do, treat us to one or two sneak peeks of what you're going to be showing people. Absolutely, I'd love to. So, uh, of course, Irish is a language, and every language has words for pretty much everything. Uh, every language can describe everything. So when it comes to stars and planets, we've got Irish words for them. But there is a difference between just translating something and using the native term for it. Uh, so, of course, railed is star. And we call stars railed or railty. And we've been using the word railed uh, since before we knew that these were big balls of hydrogen in the sky. Now, of course, over time, other things have uh, changed. So, the, for example, the constellations, these huge pictures in the sky. Different constellations get different names in different cultures. Uh, so, for example, if we move, I believe, towards morning time, uh, we should have, yeah, here we go, Orion. And Orion the Hunter is a very famous constellation. And this is the Latin name, uh, Orion. He was a hunter. But that's not the same name that's been given to Orion by every culture. Uh, Stellarium, luckily, comes with a few different sky cultures that you can show, uh, but the old Celtic names of the stars, the old Celtic constellations, haven't been well preserved enough, and um, we don't have a full sky of ancient Celtic constellations. Uh, we do have uh, pretty much a full sky for various other groups, uh, Navajo, Ojibwe, Inuit, Indian Vedic, and we can see the different parts of the sky uh, were important for these different things. So there we go, Orion looks very different if we're using the Inuit or the uh, Indian Vedic mythology. Uh, for us here in Ireland, uh, very long ago, uh, these constellations, or particularly the constellation of Orion, would have been called uh, Unvoduk, or, uh, well, Unvoduk, uh, it's believed to stem from Bodesia, a warrior princess. So Orion here is a hunter, and there's a whole ancient Greek story about Orion and Artemis and Apollo and these other hunters. However, in Irish mythology, we didn't have an Artemis, and Bodesia was the big warrior princess, and that's what fit into this area of the sky. Similarly, uh, the lion, Leo the lion, we definitely didn't have lions here in Ireland, certainly not back in the you know, 12th, 1300s. And even beforehand, you know, when people were using things like new range to figure out the seasons, we were already looking at the stars. And this wouldn't have been Leo alone, it would have been Unku, the wolf or the hound, which makes sense. You know, if we get rid of the pictures, which are very much ancient Greek, and we draw together the lines, this could be a lion, it could also be a dog sitting down. Uh, then again, if you use your imagination, these pictures of the sky could be pretty much anything. Uh, Sirius kind of looks like a puppy, and that's about the closest we get to actually seeing any of these pictures in the sky. So as well as Ku for Leo and Unvoda for Bodesia, we do have our own Irish terminology for uh, Railtlina, Calusa Railty, uh, clusters of stars, galaxies, constellations, and we will be highlighting those terms at the two o'clock planetarium show all week long. So if you don't get a chance to make your own space event or join in with one of the many other space events, you can always visit us here at Black Rock Castle. And for the two o'clock planetarium show, I'll be talking about some of the Irish, uh, Irish terms and Irish stories to do with the moon. And I will explain them in English and in Irish. So you don't have to be a fluent whale goer to join in. Well, that's very good because I am not. So <laughs> it's good to have both options. Thank you very much, Quivine. Um, We are coming up on the hour here. We're just hitting the hour mark. So we're going to just wrap up the last bits here. And I'm sure Rob and Donna have their final tips on how to complete your space art. How's it going, guys? So now that the, your exercise is done, um, you have all your shading in, you have all your design in, whatever you want to do. So what I like to do for the very end, now you can flick with the toothbrush if you want, but it's very, very messy. So you need some white paint. If you are using a toothbrush or paintbrush, it's going to have to be very, very wet. 
So your white paint, a lot of water and flick it. Or if your teacher doesn't want to be thick, you can use the back, what, you can use a very tiny paintbrush or the back of your paintbrush. So I just dip the back top of my paintbrush, not the brush part, the top part, into white and just do little stuff everywhere. So it looks like there is. And that is your painting of an exoplanet. And you can do as many stars as you like. So Donna has taken a very tidy approach. I've done that a little bit. You can see one or two of the brighter stars that I put into those blue dots that I mentioned, but I'm not as worried about making a big mess as Donna is. So I'm gonna show you how much fun of the net conversion. So as Donna said, a little bit of water on your white paint. See Daniel's kind of beach, thinks I might just be a beautiful wall <laughs> behind, but really good. My favorite thing to do to make this work is karate chop my hand in back. So basically put your hand in front like this, and then just start karate chopping like that and start blabbering things all over. And that's <laughs> there you go. You just gotta let that dry if you want to touch it up after you can, but that's the vast majority of your paint. And there you have your beautiful nebula. And we both to start with both of them, no matter what way you do it. If you do want to take the back of your brush again and just drag it down a bit, you could make a Start shape with it, with a few of them, just to give it an extra, because some of the stars will be bigger. Um, well, and guys, we do want you to share your pictures. So if you do take any, uh, if you're done, if your teacher can take some pictures, you feel free to share them with us on Space Week Ireland on Facebook. Or Twitter, or if you want to email them to us at info at spaceweek.ie, we'd love to see them and share them on the Space Week account during Space Week. So please do take some pictures and send them to us. We'd love to see how you got on. Thank you so much. I enjoyed both of those, and I'm actually pretty impressed with Rob's painting. I have to say, Donna, I knew you'd do a fantastic job. This was a given, and knew it was going to be amazing. Thank you for being tidy painting your stars while well, Rob gave me an absolute heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but actually, both of them look fabulous, guys. Thank you so much for that. I think it was really entertaining to watch. And I hope everybody is able to follow along with this tutorial and create some really cool space art of their own. Quivine, amazing. Thank you so much for your tour of the night sky. You gave us so much to look at, and it really was a blast. I just want to say... Um, to everybody watching, thank you for tuning in and thank you to the schools for tuning in. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And like Rob said, if you are, if you're able to do your own paintings, take some pictures, tag us on social media. We want to see what you're able to come up with. I think this is a really fun event. Thank you everyone. And, um, if you, I'll say one more time, if you are looking to get involved in space week and some of our space week activities, check out the spaceweek.ie website. I am going to sign off. Does everyone want to say a quick little goodbye, Rob and Donna? Hi. Hi, guys. And Quivine? Hi, everybody. Hope you liked it. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I hope everyone has a happy Space Week. Bye.